Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Wait a minute. Before we get started, I'm going to make a prediction based on this debt ceiling debacle and the suggestion that the Pentagon would have to get some cuts per today's Financial Times. I'm predicting false flag terror attack in the next 90 days. Because remember, you can't cut the military budget in America. Because what's America without a military budget that exceeds all other military budgets of every country around the world? Let's get all the other great top stories. Stacey Herbert. Max, that's all we have left. False flag attacks. False flag finance. False flag. False flag. So the first headline, Max. Gross says debt deal fails to make significant dent in deficit. So this is Bill Gross, the fund manager for uh, PIMCO, the largest bond trading fund in the world, and he says, in addition to an existing nearly $10 trillion of outstanding treasury debt, the U.S. has a near unfathomable $66 trillion of future liabilities at net present cost. So he's saying that the debt deal that's been done does nothing to address it. There still need to be trillions more in cuts, but also in taxes, which of course have not been mentioned at all. Right. The, uh, the debt is expanding. And the attempt to cut the debt means, by definition, cutting parts of the economy that would be generating revenue and tax revenue to pay off debt. So it's an impossible situation uh, where the fact of the ultimate solution being that huge debt write-off must occur is not being taken. And this is really interesting, Stacey, because ultimately Barack Obama is shirking his responsibility to address the real problem. So what is going to happen is this problem is going to be addressed by a global banking situation like the IMF, etc., which means America loses its sovereignty, as we've been saying all along. And as Bill Gross is absolutely correct, the mathematics don't add up. There's no way you can do any cuts in any combination that will create growth to pay off these debts. And this is what we mean when we say America is losing its sovereignty. Not only have we been talking about false flags, but he talks about financial repression. And this is another topic that we've discussed over and over. And he mentions that what's happened now is that there's a negative real yields. So that's a 0.93% now. If you take the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond, deduct the CPI, that get, gives you the real rate of return. And right now, it's negative 0.93%. And he calls this financial repression and So he's selling some of his treasury bonds, or at least increasing the percentage of his bonds that he holds overseas, including Canada, Mexico, Brazil, and Germany. That's right. Negative real rates. You've got to subtract uh, the CPI from what they offer down there at the Federal Reserve Bank, and you end up with a negative number, which is the same thing as to say you've got negative purchasing power, which is just as bad as hyperinflation. So the results are in and people around the world are buying gold because they tr- they're trying to maintain that purchasing power and this is why gold is hitting new highs in every currency around the world except for the Swiss franc this past couple of months but of course the Swiss franc will top out at some point and gold will be making new all-time highs against the Swiss franc soon enough so this is uh, the dynamics of a collapsing uh, debt bubble is these negative real rates of return that Bill Gross talks about and uh, it's surprising that now it's even in Germany. So that's a huge pent-up buying interest in European markets. In the German market now, will be flooding into the gold bullion market and taking gold to incredible new highs against the euro. Well, yes, Max, you kind of jumped the gun there for me. But I was going to say, yes, uh, Ed Harrison there, he was tweeting that Germany hit negative real rates as well for the first time since 1957. Part of it is the volatility. It hap- things happen so fast in this financial and global economic meltdown. So here was Bill Gross being interviewed. Oh, it was a Tuesday morning, and he's saying he was buying Germany because there were real rates of return there. But within a few hours of this article appearing in Bloomberg, Ed Harrison is reporting, oh, Germany has just gone negative. Right. And um, this is a trend that will spread around the world as the crisis really becomes more pronounced around the world. Nobody in any of the G8 or G20 countries 
is doing the right thing, which would be to start to negotiate a new Bretton Woods agreement and to recalibrate the world's currency and for the dollar to take a massive devaluation against all these other currencies. Nobody's willing to do that yet. They're going to let the, the crisis, uh, you know, as Naomi Klein calls it, uh, disaster capitalism. They just let the disasters happen and then they try to grab as much as they can uh, after the disasters happen. There's no proactive policies whatsoever. Barack Obama is the perfect poster child for disaster capitalism. He's not taking one proactive action at all. He's just letting this thing collapse, which is great for bankers on Wall Street because it increases their fees, it increases the debt load, and it just makes them a part of this emerging kleptocracy, billionaires, uh, really at the expense of everybody else. Yes, that's another thing Bill Gross had said earlier, which was that America is only uh, dealing with the numerator, not the denominator. The denominator in the deficit problem being jobs, and nobody's addressing the jobs. But I want to move on to the other safe haven that is gold, as you mentioned earlier. Gold coins sell out in Lisbon as biggest bet sees 22% gain. And remember, we reported a few years ago that the gold was selling out in Germany. So the Germans were, uh, they sensed this negative real rates coming and they were buying gold earlier than what now uh, the Portuguese are now buying it. And the article points out that gold has advanced 15% this year and treasuries by comparison have returned 4.2%. So those are the two safe havens. Gold has returned 15% and treasuries 4.2%. Right, and don't forget silver is up more than 30% this year. It was up 70% last year. You know, and this negative real interest rate story, again, as it relates to gold, is very interesting because negative real interest rates, people equate with deflation, and they equate deflation with an environment that's poor for gold. But historically, a negative real interest rates or quote-unquote deflation is actually the best time to be buying gold. And uh, so gold is working in either the deflation uh, which is really another word for hyperinflation, hyperinflation or inflation. So there's really a no-lose situation. There's no top on gold because there's no amount of destruction that uh, one can imagine won't visit the fiat currencies around the world because the fiat currency grid is going to go the way of the dodo. That means that there's no top on gold. $10,000 an ounce for gold? Yeah, of course. It could go a lot higher because fiat currencies are going to zero. Well, according to the Bloomberg article, they said that gold will rise as high as 1,713 this year and 1,938 in 2012, according to the median in a survey of the four most accurate precious metals forecasters tracked by Bloomberg over the past two years. That may mean 12 consecutive annual gains, the longest winning streak since at least 1920. Right, and we're going to be talking about this winning streak continuing for another 10 years at least. And the only bubble in this situation is the U.S. dollar. You know, the U.S. dollar is down, and it's still in a massive bubble, as all this debt ceiling debate debacle proves. There is no underlying growth scenario one can construct that would equal pay down on debt in any configuration. But also, Max, the other thing is, is gold would have the longest winning streak since at least 1920. German rates negative for the first time since 1957. And yet none of the mainstream financial press or any of the mainstream politicians here in America address the historic nature of just exactly how extreme the situation is in America, what we're going through globally. And, and yet the real numbers, the, the, you're seeing the real fact of how, dis how much distress there is out there in the actual numbers and facts. Because they're paper bugs. You know, they worship paper. They are paper jihadis. They are paper extremists. They believe the dollar is somehow connected to this uh, never, never land of always great for bankers and we don't care about everybody else. And it's run its course. It's finished. It's over. It's a 25 year paper bull market's finished. Okay, Max, well, I uh, have one more gold headline here. Bank of Korea buys gold first time since 97, 98 crisis. They're taking my advice! They're taking my advice! Obviously, Max, they watched the Kaiser report. South Korea's central bank bought 25 tons of gold over the past two months in its first purchase in more than a decade. 
So they added this to their 14 tons of gold already held, and they bought this at a value of $1.24 billion. And But apparently, Max, they're actually storing this gold in London at the Bank of England. Oh, well, that's not a good idea, because the London bullion market is extremely corrupt. And uh, if they are smart, they'll demand physical delivery of this gold, and they'll store it somewhere safely in Korea. Korea, listen to me. Listen to Max. Come closer to the TV. Come, come over here, Korea. Put your ear to the TV. Any gold you store in London, you will lose. Okay? You will lose. So if you want to actually make the smart move, demand physical delivery to your own country, or you're never going to see that gold. Well, in fact, you might end up like Greece, because that's in my next headline, Max. Greece begins 50 billion euro privatization drive. So the starting gun for one of the biggest fire sales in Western history was fired as Greek officials began appointing advisors for the country's ambitious privatization drive. Well, Greece lost its sovereignty, and now they're selling the pieces of the corpse. And the Greek people need to understand that they no longer have a country. There's a fire sale at Greece. They're selling off the family assets, the family jewels. But the Greek people are no longer free. They now are slaves for the IMF and the global bankers. Good job, Greece. Here's a great uh, quote. After years of resisting privatizations, the breakneck speed at which Athens has agreed to conduct the sales nearly one every 15 days has raised fears that state jewels will be sold at rock bottom prices that was the point that's the point of getting moody's and s p to downgrade your debt that's the point of paying off papadreas under the table he's a corrupt uh world leading um slime ball uh, that's the point of having hedge funds like Paulson worked with Goldman Sachs in your country last year to meet up to decide how to sell off your state assets. That's the point of having Steve Forbes in the International Chamber of Commerce having a meeting over there at the Hotel Britannia a couple of months ago to decide how to sell your state assets. That's what happens when you lose your sovereignty. That's what happens when you sell your soul to the devil. That's what happens when you let the IMF into your home. If you ever see a banker on an airplane, report it immediately to the pilot. It's a dangerous situation. Don't let bankers on airplanes. They're going to countries, and they're going to blow those countries up with weapons of mass financial destruction. No bankers on airplanes. If you see a banker on an airplane, report it immediately to the TSA. Okay, Maxwell. In fact, I have a story about bankers. The last headline here, Goldman Sachs traders quit with big bonuses drying up. So more than a dozen traders, according to this article, have quit Goldman Sachs' North American government bonds and derivatives trading desk in New York in recent months as the bank takes fewer risks and big bonuses for ambitious traders dry up. Another false flag is coming, and there will be plenty of opportunity for you to rape the country financially again, and all your Christmas bonus wishes will come true. All right, Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. All right, don't go away. Much more coming your way, so stay right there. Hungry for the full story? We've got it firsthand. The biggest issues get a human voice, face-to-face -face with the newsmakers on RT. The history of this place runs through the centuries. A paradise for archaeologists, zoologists, and ecological tourists. But one fatal night, shots destroyed the harmony of life. How this republic got its life back. Hoping, dreaming, and recreating. Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to financial journalist and blogger extraordinaire Terry Boole. Terry Boole, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. 
Hi, Max. It's great to see you. Terry, uh, we spoke to you last year, and uh, when your article in The Atlantic came out, made big news, email suggests Bear Stearns cheated clients out of billions. Give us a bit of the summary uh, and uh, update the story if you can for us. Sure, Max. Th this was a case where Bear Stearns mortgage traders, led by an executive named Tom Morano, who's now the CEO of ResCap, him and his team were literally stealing billions from their own clients. Those clients happened to be um, monolines, insurers and investors in residential mortgage-backed securities. Sir, now Tom Morano, he's currently CEO of what company? Of, of ResCap. ResCap is a subdivision of Ally Financial, the former GMAC. Okay, so as all of these uh, firms that were caught engaged in massive securities fraud, instead of any kind of legal precedent being applied and anyone going to jail, they simply had to change the name of the shop or go to a new shop or close a shop and reinvent a shop. I mean, this is a classic bucket shop scheme of Wall Street from a few decades ago, reinvented for the modern era using derivatives. Instead. And just recycling, recycling uh, the men who allegedly in this case are committing actually this time criminal acts of fraud and stealing. All right, but if without the criminal acts and fraud, American economy would show an, a huge negative GDP growth because isn't negative actions, negative uh, accounting and fraud, isn't that the basis of America's GDP currently, Terry Bull? <laughs> you might be right about that. Um, in this case, though, th this was the most egregious behavior we had seen come from executives, senior executives, heads of mortgages, heads of the whole group, um, literally telling their clients that, hey, you know what, I know you think that these residential securities aren't performing and the loans aren't working out. I, I hear you. Um, but we disagree with you. So, so we're not going to give you back your money for this bad product we, we sold you. And in the meantime, then, they, 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 knew, they knew the product was bad. And they, they went out, and they actually got the money back from the other people that they bought some loans from. And then they pocketed it for themselves instead of put, giving it back to the investors. And, and then that's the heart of this case. Um, if you don't mind, I kind of wanted to just update what's going on now. Uh, a few other publications like the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg have started to pick up on the story finally. Um, I reported a few months ago that the Manhattan DA was finally stepping up the investigation. I've interviewed people he's interviewed, um, and that they were looking to use the Martin Act to charge Tom Morano, Jeff Fertilizer, who now works at Goldman Sachs, and Mike Nirenberg, who now works at Bank of America. Explain the Martin Act. The, the Martin Act, the, the, that's what Elliot Spitzer was famous for. That's what he went after analysts like Henry Blodgett. Um, it's very wide sweeping. It's basically saying, you know, if you've committed any form of fraud, um, we're going to charge you with this and make it a criminal event. You know, I can tell you that it's now the New York Attorney General who is extremely active in his investigation. And, and I've seen some of the evidence that he's collected from a documentary filmmaker who has just finished a movie called The Confidence Game. His name is Nick Verbitsky. It's about the fraud instead of Bear Stearns, and he has hours of whistleblower tapes, unedited tapes, that I know the AG is looking at now. Um, additionally, what's more interesting is one of our whistleblowers, his name was Matt Van Leeuwen. He's in my The Atlantic Story, and he's in Nick's movie. Um, Matt had actually agreed to testify against Bear Stearns, and a few weeks before he went out and did his deposition, um, he all of a sudden was lawyered up. J.P. Morgan said, you have to have a lawyer because you worked for us and there was a severance, et cetera, et cetera. He went into those depositions and he changed his testimony. He, he said what he told me and the documentary filmmaker that he made up, um, that, that all the illegal activity he was whistleblowing on wasn't true. Uh, what happened now, he was lying. Um, I mean, we double-checked his information. We had multiple sources. We saw emails. We know he's lying. So we're trying to figure out right now, is, is this a case that, that bears outside counsel, outside lawyers, you know, paid him off, got him to change your testimony? Did Tom Morano and his traders pay him off? So what the lawyers for these mono lines, it, the law firm is PBWT based here in New York. The lead attorney, his name is Eric Haas. What he was able to do is get a Texas court where Matt Van Leeuwen lives, uh, to subpoena his emails, and we saw in there that, that he lied, um, that, that what he originally said was true. We saw some emails about covering up uh, before he was going to go in and testify, 
And so it's re- this evidence is pre- presented to the New York Attorney General, and it's up for him to really bring Matt Van Leeuwen in, you know, put him in, in, <laughs> in front of a lineup almost, right, in front of prosecutors and ask, you know, who got you to change your testimony? How scared is J.P. Morgan? Right. Uh, Attorney generals typically, uh, when they get a high-profile case, it's a political springboard. Is that uh, part of the motivation here, do you think? Absolutely. Well, the evidence is so strong. So here's the next thing I think would be really interesting. Two weeks ago, I mean, J.P. Morgan is scared. They, they file motions like, okay, the fraud claims should be stayed, they shouldn't be allowed, and then judges will overrule those. Um, there is a five-year statute of limitations in New York, and this case has now been moved to state court. I know that they're trying to do some weird maneuvering around so that it doesn't affect their ratings with the rating agencies if they do have to pay out over, you know, billions in damages, which I believe they will. Um, they went and moved two weeks ago. They, they own EMC now because they bought Bear Stearns, which is the mortgage servicer that a lot of the illegal activity happened in, they went and took all of the assets out of EMC and put it into like a branch of a J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. And what that effectively did is any of the plaintiffs, it would make them hard to recover money and judgments by taking the cash and the assets out of EMC. Now, now that's illegal. There's a contract that says that they're not allowed to do that, that they have to ask permission to do that. I mean, so it's these kind of moves that we can see. J.P. Morgan is scared. They know this is real. And I think Tom Moreno, Mike Nirenberg, and Jeff Bersalais are very afraid if they're tampering witnesses. Yeah, it's funny to see some of the techniques used by bucket shop operators used by a firm like J.P. Morgan by uh, renaming accounts, renumbering accounts, changing from margin accounts to cash accounts to make it impossible for these accounts to be either peered into or to have any kind of paperwork associated with them. So, but this is really associated with, I remember working on Wall Street back in the early 1980s, there were some notorious bucket shops working at that time, and uh, they're out of business now, but uh, they were put out of business by folks like J.P. Morgan that have taken the whole bucket shop mentality and fraud and securities fraud to just a wholesale level that's a $156 billion company. So what could potentially be the hit to J.P. Morgan's balance sheet? And do you see anybody now starting to short J.P. Morgan stock ahead of the revelations of these scandals and the proof that the company is basically insolvent? Yes, so the actual damages, I just, I just checked on this, between three monoline insurers you know, suing J.P. Morgan is one, a little over $1.7 billion. So in this case, there are fraud claims, which equals punitive damages. And trust me, um, they want to go to trial on this. They do not want to settle. So, th- th- I mean, that, that could be like a $10 billion hit to J.P. Morgan's balance sheet. Yeah, absolutely. And that's on top of the liability associated with their unhedged silver naked short position. That's probably another 40 or 50 billion. You're talking 1.6, 1.7 billion here, plus punitive damages. Um, so what about the hedge fund community? Okay, and so the pretty, hedge funds, pretty, right. I so I have gotten some emails. Um, it's primarily from uh, equity shops, equity hedge funds, who are starting to, they send out um, documentation in court cases to reporters. And, you know, they have big short positions on anyone who's going to get hit with these mortgage-backed security um, fraud claims or liabilities. So they're shorting J.P. Morgan. They're shorting Bear Stearns. They're going long AMBAC, actually, or long assured guarantees, the people who think will get a windfall from the suit. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're pretty close with the hedge fund community out there in, in Connecticut, where I think it's actually the hedge fund capital of, of, of the world. And uh, so you've got your ear pretty close to the, to the street out there in terms of what the head, big hedge funds are doing. So you're, you're hearing whisperings from the, from the hedge fund street uh, that um, the time to short J.P. Morgan's stock is, is upon us. Absolutely. Uh-huh. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a few funds who have a very, you know, the, a very focused strategy. It might take them a year for this to play out. Yeah. Well, I mean, the interest, of course, is anyone who's hoping to uh, have America avoid the kind of loss of sovereignty that we've seen in Greece or we've seen in Ireland, if anyone who wants the uh, American sovereignty to remain intact and not be taken over by the likes of the IMF working with J.P. Morgan, then it, they, they would want to see J.P. Morgan's stock go the way of Enron 
uh, down to zero. And of course, the comparison to Enron is a good one because Enron, of course, had 80 billion parked off their balance sheet. When it was revealed, the stock went to zero. Uh, JP Morgan's got, by some estimates, over a trillion dollars in liabilities off the balance sheet. Once that's put back on the balance sheet, then the stock is insolvent, the stock goes to zero, which is something people should be rooting for if they want to maintain sovereignty in America. If they want to be debt slaves, of course, then just give J.P. Morgan free reign to write laws and commit securities fraud all day long, and you can be a debt slave, too. So going forward... Wait, actually, Max, I, I think this is more about the cover-up that, that J.P. Morgan has executed in the last year. And, and I think if the, if, if the American um, Main Street investor, it, or let's just say if the government, if the U.S. government ever wants to restore faith, for Main Street investors to go back and invest in equities and invest in Wall Street companies, they have to bring some criminal charges. And this this is an easy slam dunk case. I do not see how these guys are not charged criminally. Well, they know that in instances in other countries, whistleblowers uh, have been assassinated uh, when they have revealed some of the banking terrorists at work in these foreign countries. So I would imagine people are afraid of the assassins in the employ of banks like J.P. Morgan to take them out. But I think at some point, um, one has an obligation if one has information. And the attorney general, certainly, hopefully, he's got the cojones to take the, take the case to its legal uh, conclusion. We only have a few seconds left. Any closing thoughts? Yes, Max, I just wanted to let you know next month I'm going to be reporting there is a significant development in this case with new evidence that has come forward um, that I, I think will blow the case open and, and make this a no-brainer for this team to be charged. More people have contacted me, more whistleblowers, and I know the AG has interviewed them. How many? Let's just say it's, it's over a dozen. Over a dozen? Yes. Okay, well, hopefully one of them will actually come forth and do the do. All right, Terry Bull, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Great to see you, Max. Thanks for having me. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Terry Bull. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.